Hey, Crossbridge, I, I hope you're enjoying uh, this service so far, and I hope it's, being, um, it's, been, it's been meaningful to you. So thankful for our tech folks who are making all of this happen, as, as well as our worship team and, and just everyone is taking to, to bring this to you and for us to be able to worship together. Hey, one of the things that's been kind of hard on us as a staff is um, just wondering, like, what, what's going on in our people's lives, right? Like, who has stuff going on? Um, how do we know, like, what the needs are? Truthfully, how, how can we pray for you? As some of you, I know this is, this is really hard and you're struggling. And so we came up with something this week that I think is really, really simple. And, and we're trying to keep it as simple as possible. And, and here it is, that if you've got something going on in your life that you want us to pray for you in regards to, um, go right now. You can email prayer at crossbridge.church. Again, I'm going to say it one more time, prayer at crossbridge.church. That gives our staff just a really good chance to continue to, again, to pray for you, to know what the needs are, and to support you. Um, as I know, this is, a, this is a difficult time. Speaking of that, I also know this. As, as I share with you, uh, I, I feel more pressure than normal. Um, I can't help it. Uh, I, I feel as though this is probably a time when many of you are at a, probably at a place you haven't been at in a while, that we've got a lot more fear and anxiety than normal. And, and we need to hear from Jesus even more so than normal. That we need him to speak into us and we need him to bring peace and we need him to bring hope. And I also know this, that as much as probably you've been surfing online and, and you've been on uh, social media platforms, that you're, you're receiving a lot of what I'd call fear-driven, anxiety kind of stuff. And so I just want to say this. I hope that this one hour Maybe you need to come to multiple services, so you have two hours or three hours, but I hope that this is encouraging to you, and I have prayed and asked the Lord to meet us here, no matter where here is, that he would meet you right here, and, and he would tend to your heart today. So I want to pray for us as we go any further. Father, man, I am thankful for you. I'm thankful for the hope that you give us for the peace that you say is a gift to us. I'm thankful that none of this is beyond, as we talked about last week, it, it's not beyond your hands. It's, it's not beyond what you can intercede and, and make this tremendous difference in the world around us. But, but even beyond that today, you can make the difference inside of us, of how we walk through these days, of how we embrace uncertainty. And God, I just pray, I ask right now in homes, in cars, on phones, on computers, families, that, Lord, you would just calm us. Help us to hear from your word. Help, help to connect it to our hearts. And God, I pray at the end of this that we would just know we've been in your presence. Help me to choose my words carefully. And God, use these words today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <clears throat> so have you ever been traveling in a caravan? Um, and, and maybe, you know, I, this is how it works, right? You, you get in line and there's multiple cars and you're, you're following each other. I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but you're following along and, and you can just kind of tell that the lead car doesn't know where it's going, right? And, and eventually what happens is that lead car pulls into a parking lot and begins to circle around. And then all the other cars, we pull in and we circle around and then we all get back in line and everybody turns left to go back the opposite direction. Is that not annoying? right? Um, we've all been in that kind of thing. In fact, it's, it's the feeling of following when we have no idea where we're going. I was thinking about a series that would really help us to navigate the waters that we find ourselves in right now. And, and that's where I came up with the idea of uncertainty. See, I, I know as a church, we say one of our core values is to embrace change. But if we're honest, this is getting ridiculous, right? Uh, every day, like, I feel like I get up and I just know something's going to change. That I'm going to watch the news at 2.30, not, not that I am every day, I'm going to watch the news at 2.30 and I'm going to see that there's more changes. That I'm going to see that the world continues to change and I'm going to have to adapt. T to be honest, that's stressful. It's stressful to think about the things that are changing and and it gives me feelings inside of this, this churning of uncertainty. And I'm guessing that it's doing the same for you. The good news is, when I was thinking about the Bible, there's lots of places that talk about uncertainty. 
There's lots of stories that include this idea of uncertainty. One that came to mind this week is found in Luke chapter 9, starting at verse 57 through 62. The title of this section is called The Cost of Following Jesus. So I want to read that to you. As they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place even to lay his head. He said to another person, come, follow me. And the man agreed, but he said, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. But Jesus told him, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Your duty is to go and to preach about the kingdom of God. Another said, yes, Lord, I'll follow you, but first let me go and say goodbye to my family. But Jesus told him, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. As I was looking through um, reading that portion of scripture, and I was just thinking about this big concept, right? That following Jesus does not guarantee certainty in our lives. Luke 9, 57, 58, let me read it to you again. As they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests. Now, now catch this line. But the son of man has no place even to lay his head. This was Jesus' way of saying, hey, you can follow me, but I'm really not sure where we're going. In fact, I'm not even sure where we're going to sleep tonight. Now, you may say, Kevin, I thought we were bringing hope, right? I thought we were bringing comfort. And if following Jesus means that we're always going to have to embrace uncertainty, I'm not sure how hopeful that is. And I I, I hear you. In fact, but I do think this. This is Jesus' way of saying to his followers that following him is going to look a little different. Luke chapter 9, 59 and 60 said this. He said to another person, come follow me. And the man agreed. But he said, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. But Jesus told him, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Your duty is to go and to preach about the kingdom of God. Big picture, right? Like we're going on mission together. I'm not sure what every day is going to mean. I'm not sure we're going to lay our head at night, but trust me and just come and follow me. I do think though, this is something that Jesus wanted his followers to wrestle with. I think what he was saying was, we're going to walk this journey out together, but I can't guarantee you every day where the provision is going to come from. Man, is that not relevant to where we find ourselves, right? Like every day wondering, like, God, how in the world are you going to work this out? I, I flew in an airplane about three weeks ago, and I, I went to Florida, of all places, right? And I went down for a conference to be with other pastors, and that conference ended, and, and then I jumped, you know, went to the airport to jump on the plane again and head back home, and, and I did what we all do, right? You wait for your, your group to be called, and then you make your way through the line, and, and I found myself, I was one of the last groups and so as, as I was getting on that airplane, one of the last groups, on, on the way back to my seat, I took my bag and I threw it up top and then I began to walk. And, and I'm sure you do the same thing, right? You look and see what your, what your row is, um, what number, and then you look and see what letter you are, right? To figure out what your seat is. So I'm, I'm studying these numbers, you know, and, and so I've got the number in my head. I've got an idea of where I'm going to be. And I was, I believe, letter B, which as I looked and I studied, meant I was in the middle seat. Don't you hate the middle seat, right? Um, but it, you know, is what it is, right? And so I get back to my row and, and there's a lady sitting on the aisle. I can see her. And, and I think she saw me too, like eyeing the row. And, and there was the window seat still open and then the middle seat was open. And I said, excuse me, ma'am, like my seat's in here. And so she got up and I could tell, like maybe she was having a bad day. And, and I, you know, understandable, right? None of us wanted to be traveling during all this. And, and I sat down in my seat, which was the middle seat. The moment I sat down and she sat back down, she let out this, what, what I would call a huff. A, a sigh is one thing. It's kind of a huff. It was a, it was one of those, right? And, and in fact, I, I kind of looked at her. I felt the, and I also felt kind of an eye roll, right? Now, now growing up, my mom was really good at the huff and the eye roll. And, and so I, I love you, mom, but you were good at it. And, and, and so I was kind of, I grew up huffing the eye roll, like it, I just don't like it. Right. And, and I thought, huh, what was that about? Right. And then she let out another little, huh, like, like 
she was so distraught that I was sitting there. And so all I did was I just kind of looked over at her. It's kind of to say like, are you okay, right? We were communicating. And, and she said to me, she said, when I purchased this seat, no one was sitting there. And she said it just like that. Like looking at me like, I am so annoyed that you're here. And I said, well, like, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Like I purchased the seat. And so this is where I'm sitting. And, um, and I did say, I said, if, if no one comes, you know, I'll, I'll be more than happy to move over here. And, and so sure enough, she sat there. She looked so annoyed with me. And um, so finally, you know, I said, I said, hey, uh, you know, I don't want to sit here any more than, than you want me sitting here. I, I would prefer to sit over. Th- Actually, I didn't. I said that in my head, right? But that's what I wanted to say. And, and sure enough, eventually, um, no one, we, we kept watching, right? People would come on and you're just watching. Are they looking at that seat? Are they looking at us? And sure enough, so finally I was like, hey, I can move over. And, and I did. But that lady, mm, I wanted to give her some Jesus, right? And so, um, but, but anyway, but point is this. I wanted to say, hey, I realized when you signed up, like when, when you purchased your ticket, I wasn't sitting here, but I purchased a ticket too. And things don't always work out like you like them to. Like, hello to the world, right? That's exactly where we find ourselves. When I think about uncertainty, it, it's, this, it's this thing that inside of us that is just like, it's not always certain. It's not always like gonna work out like we hope. In fact, people, they're gonna disappoint us, right? The market is not always gonna go up. We, we've seen that in the last couple of weeks. People are gonna get sick. And, and, and I think about this. The world in the upcoming weeks, like, what is it going to look like? The, the truth is we're surrounded by uncertainty. The only thing that is guaranteed is that as much as we want to guess that none of us really know what's going to take place. Here's our challenge. Our challenge as people of God is to hang on to the faith that we have. And when I say hang on, I mean hang on. Like hang on tight. Here's what Hebrews chapter 11 says, verses one through three. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. And what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. It's this great picture of, we talked about last week, this this God who created it all, who holds everything in the palm of his hand, and, and the truth is we put our confidence and our trust even though, we put it in him even though we cannot see. I was reading through that passage trying to decide what to preach to us today, asking the Lord for help. And I was reading through Hebrews chapter 11 and, and I was reminded that we're not the only ones who find ourselves in this boat. In fact, if you looked across, if you looked across the history of the Bible, especially the, even the Old Testament, you would see over and over that people were in these spots of uncertainty. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat before it ever rained, right, Uh, to save his family from the flood. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed God um, when God called him to leave and go to another land, and he had no idea where he was really going. It was by faith that Sarah was able to have a child, even though she was barren and she was extremely old. It was by faith that Abraham offered his son Isaac. We could go on and on and on. The Bible's full of these kinds of stories of people who who faced uncertainty and were trusting God to come through. In fact, as as I was reading through those stories, and I could have just kept, I could have kept naming them, you know, one after another after another. But a little bit later in that long list, in verse 29, here's what it says. It was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground. It goes on to say, but when the Egyptians tried to follow, they were all drowned. As I read that, and I was still thinking about, man, what do I talk to Crossbridge about? In this in this, oh, this opportunity, what do I talk to them about? And instantly, that story, that story jumped off the pages at me. I flipped to it as fast as I could. I found it in Exodus chapter 14, and it is a powerful story. And so it's, it's this long story that I don't have all the time to share with you today, so I just want to pick out pieces. Sometimes when I read an Old Testament story, what I look for is I look at, like, what are the people doing, right? Um, what are maybe some of the great leaders doing? And then what is God doing? And so that's kind of how I want to walk through this story. So let's talk about the people. 
Exodus chapter 14, verses 10 through 12, it says, And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Because there was no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us out up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would be better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Here's the picture. God has orchestrated this. And, and these folks are camped out right before water's edge. You know, I, I can kind of picture it. There's, a, there's, in a sense, a campground here. There's tents everywhere. And, and here's what they know, right? That they are being pursued, that they feel hemmed in, that they know there's, not, there's nowhere to go. The battle is on. They're going to be outnumbered. What in the world are we going to do in the face of uncertainty? Man, when I looked at the people, I was like, I can relate to them. I, I looked, I noticed three things. The first thing, it says, so they were very afraid. I've had my moments, according to Facebook, you have, you, you have too. We've all had our moments where I think fear begins to rise up. Anx anxiety, it rises up. And, and I think all of us are doing our best to manage it, but that's, that's where we live right now. Uh, fear is, is everywhere, and it's being talked about. I mean, flip on the news Flip on, flip through, scroll through. Uh, it, it's everywhere. People are scared. And, and you know, I, at times I, I don't blame them. You look at what the people did here too. It says they cried out to the Lord. Man, that's actually a good thing for us to do. Um, and I think I'm seeing some people do that who are saying, hey, let's have days of prayer. Hey, like, let's call on God. Hey, let's pray for our healthcare workers, right? Hey, let's pray for uh, a cure to this thing. Let's pray that we slow the curve. Um, all kinds of things, right? But we are we're crying out to God. And in the last piece that I saw that the people were doing is they were just, they were getting angry. They were getting angry and they were blaming Moses and God at the same time for getting them to the place and where they found themselves. And I thought, man, that is so, like, it is so tempting for us to go there. It is so tempting for us to say, God, how in the world could you let it get to this point? Like, God, you need to intercede and get this done. Like, did you really lead us here so that we could all be trapped in our houses, like, right, facing this coronavirus? I, I think we can relate to this. Even though these folks are like, this is way back here in the Old Testament. Man, I see this. I see it all around us. Now, let's talk about Moses. Here's the picture, right? You got this leader, and he's challenging his people to rise up. Beautiful picture. It says in verses 13 and 14, and Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. He goes on to say, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. God's gonna do this today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. Now, I love this line. This is probably a line you need to put somewhere. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Man, like, hear that. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. That, that, that is a great, that's a great line. See, we need, I, I'm just going to speak to us as Crossbridge. Um, we need you to step up. Like, as God's people, this is our chance to step up. It's our, it's our chance to step up and to say, fear is not our friend. In fact, fear drives us to some irrational thinking. Fear is not our friend. And, and when we feel fear, may we be drawn to cry out to God. May we be drawn to pray, right? To, to pray and to ask God to give us the, the gift in which he's promised. He says, there's a gift of peace that the world can't give. The world will give you handfuls of anxiety. He is the only one who can give you peace. Don't be afraid. Fear's not our friend. And, and this, little, this little thing caught me by like, it kind of grabbed my imagination a little bit. It says, stand still. And I thought, what is that about? Like, stand still. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And then if you skip down to that last line, for the Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. I, I picture there's this mess going on, and he's saying, stand strong. You don't need to run. 
You don't need to retreat. You don't need to be in fear. You don't need to cower down. Stand strong. Why? Because the Lord stands with us fighting for us. You know, it, it reminds me like when I was younger, right? Like I, I was willing to stand and, and be tough as long as I had my brother standing right behind me. That's the picture that we would stand and be strong because we know who stands behind us, beside us, in front of us, that God's promise is to be with us through the good and through the bad. I was reminded when um, Rachel and I lived in Virginia and we went up and we were gonna do some hiking in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And, and we went and we took our little pug with us. At the time, her name was Freddie. Oh, I miss that little dog. And we took Freddie with us. When we got to the trail, it said, like, you cannot bring dogs. Do not bring dogs. And then it had, like, also information about bears. Be aware of bears. And I thought, okay, I'm, I'm putting this all together, right? And I thought to myself, number one, there could be bears along the trail, which concerned me, you know. Number two, I thought, is my dog going to attract a bear. And so, um, but there was nothing we could do, you know, we couldn't leave Freddie in the car, short nose, dog, suffocation, right? Um, so we took her with us. But, but here, here's a couple things that, you know, were probably in my mind. Think about this way. Number one, um, I'm faster than Rachel. Now, I, I'm not going to say I'm going to leave Rachel with the bear, but the truth is I'm faster than Rachel. Um, number two, now this was probably the real thought. And, and, I, and I thought it and I would have done it. I thought, and I said it out loud. Um, Rachel didn't like it, but I said it. I said, worst case scenario, if we see a bear and a bear's approaching, I'm throwing the pug. I'm throwing the pug and I'm, and I'm gonna run. And I'm sorry, Freddie, you've been a great dog, but if it's between us and you, it will be you. You will be free dinner and we will go back to the car. Um, you know, think, think about it this way though. Here, here's what they really tell you in the midst of because I've researched, um, in the midst, if, if you were be out hiking in Starve Rock and see a bear, not gonna happen because they're not out there, right? But if you were hiking somewhere and you saw a bear, what are you supposed to do? Thoughts? Yeah, feel free, type them in. But here's what I'd say. You're not supposed to turn and run. To turn and run would be the absolute worst thing to do. What they say is, right, stand and look strong. Like stand and, and make a presence, right? Um, that would be really hard to do. Can you imagine a bear staring at you and you're like, come on, come on bear, right? Like, what, what do you do, right? But standing, that this is the picture I see. That, that God is saying, we're not made to be people who run. We're not made to be people who are fearful. We're not made to be people who don't have options. We are made to be people who stand believing and knowing that our God stands and fights for us. Folks, this is the place in which the faith that we talk about when we actually gather in rooms, this is the place where that faith comes in handy. This is the place where we practice who we say we are. This is the place where we insert in conversations of fear, we insert hope. It's the place when we watch people and we were around people who were so full of turmoil that we insert peace. Like this is our place to be people of faith. And, and I love what that last line says. He says, you shall hold your peace. Okay, this is, this is truth, vulnerability, right? Peace is a battle. Sometimes I, I have it, other times I don't. It, um, Last week, I was watching the news, and I felt like I was doing really well, and I think I just watched a little too much, and it was late at night. I couldn't turn it off. I was watching that silly news, and, um, and inside, I, I, I began to feel it like the anxiety was rising up. Um, I was listening. Someone said this is good, could go on for five or six months. Like they, were, they, they all say different things, right? But I was listening, and I just felt it. I felt the anxiety rising up. And I, and I just reached over the remote and I turned it off. I was like, I can't take any more, right? I'm not looking at Facebook. I'm not looking at, at, at the news. I, I, I need a break because here's the deal. That stuff steals my peace if I'm not careful. If, if I'm taking my cues from the news and I'm taking my cues from social media, I'm taking my cues from like reading all these articles, that is not peace giving. 
my time with Jesus, my time in the word, my time talking to him, my time listening to some of the songs that we're singing, that's where my peace comes from. And so I, I'm guessing that for you too. Some of you, you, you're wound right now because you, you're focusing on the wrong things. This is the time to zero in on our relationship with God. In fact, let's just talk about God in the midst of this story. Here's, here's kind of the big picture, and I want you to go read it later. Exodus chapter 14. God is all over this story. He's all over it. He was all over the scenes of this story. He told the Israelites where to camp. He told them to camp there. He hardened Pharaoh's heart to get that, that huge army to where um, they were camped. God raised up a leader by the name of Moses. He instructs him what to do. Raise your hands and lead your people through. You know, picture that water standing up on edge. He sent troubles to the Egyptian army. It was an interesting line in that story. And it said that the chariot wheels like had issues. He led the Egyptian army to the middle of those great waters. And then in the midst of that story, those waters closed in on them. Powerful, powerful. Now, in the midst of that, there was another line that caught me. And it was Exodus chapter 14, verse 24. And here's what it says. Now it came to pass. Man, that was hope giving. Now it came to pass. My faith, my hope informs me of something. This will come to pass. It will come to pass. Our job right now is to keep doing what we're doing. Focus on the mission the Lord has us on. Hang on to the peace he's given us. Stand strong, not in fear, but in his strength. Like, God has this. God was working before the coronavirus. God's working in the midst of the coronavirus. And God will be working on the other side of the coronavirus. I am confident of it. God is the sustaining factor in the story that we just read in Exodus chapter 14. And God can be the sustaining factor in your story as well. Here'd be my prayer for us. God, move us from fear. Move us to a recognition that you are on the scene. Help us to trust in your presence. In fact, to count on it, to stand strong, knowing you're standing with us. And, and here's, here's what I am, I am confident of, that this is the time where you need Jesus more than you ever have. This is a time where your faith, it, it, it's real. And if it hasn't been, it needs to be now. Maybe you're here and maybe you'd say, I've walked with Jesus a long time, but, but Kevin, I've, I've not been as close as I should be. I just want to tell you, just, just talk to him about it. Confess to him that you've not been in as tight as you've wanted to be with him, but you need him now. And I can tell you, he, he'll meet you right now. He'll meet you in your living room. He will meet you in your car. He will meet you, children. Like, he, he will meet you and he will help you to find peace. And maybe you're listening. Maybe it's your first time at Crossbridge. Welcome. Welcome in the midst of all of this, right? But maybe you're saying, man, I tuned in today because I need something. I need some hope. I need some peace. I need something to hang on to. And what I would tell you is, Jesus has been hanging on you for a long time. He's been waiting for you to hang on to him. He has pursued you from the day you were born. He desires a relationship with you. He desires to bring you the gift of peace. He desires to give you hope that you've never known. Hope that goes beyond anything this world can offer. And, and here's the picture. God sent his son to lay down his life and to die for your sins. What he asks of us is that we believe in him, that we would confess our sins and that we would believe in our heart that God sent his son to die for us. And what scripture says is if we do that and we acknowledge him and we acknowledge our need for him, he will save us. Father, for those who are listening, maybe it's folks who just say, I'm not as close to you as I want to be, God, and I confess and I'm turning towards you. God, may you meet them there right now. And God, maybe there's people. Maybe it's their first time at Crossbridge. Maybe people, Lord, who they showed up looking for something. God, I know they're not looking for something. They're looking for someone. They're looking for you to walk with them in the midst of this time. And I pray you'd help them, give them assurance and confidence 
the, the words I'm speaking to them, they're truth. And that God, you desire a relationship with them and they can start that relationship now. That all they've got to do is just voice their heart. That God, I need you. And they can start it today. God, thank you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, maybe you made a decision today to recommit your life to Jesus. Or maybe you made a decision today to start brand new in this relationship with Jesus. And if you did, I'm so proud of you. And I, and I just know, according to Scripture, His peace is going to overflow you and He's going to help you in these uncertain days ahead. He wants to walk with you. We would love to know if you made that decision. Uh, there's another email. I'm going to make this really, really simple. Um, it's called Next Steps at crossbridge.church. Next steps at crossbridge.church. Send us an email. Tell us what's going on in your life. Let us be encouragement to you. Let us follow up with you. Thank you so much for showing up and worshiping with us across. We have a song that you're gonna, it's gonna speak to you. It's powerful words. And so I want you to listen to this song as our worship team leads us now.